This is, in fact, uh, my fourth time to be here. I, the only reason I remember that, I must confess to you, is that I went to sign the book recording my visit. I saw three previous signatures. <laughs> but it's great to be here, and it's great to be here with you. What I want to talk a little bit this morning about is about this call to perseverance that seems to go through all of the scripture. And in fact, the opening collect says, preserve, we're asking God to do something, in other words, preserve the work of your mercy, that your church throughout the world may be steadfast. In other words, what we're doing in that prayer is that we're asking God to help us out. Left to my own devices, I might give up. I might not persevere. Persevere means life is difficult. And it takes some courage and fortitude and an ability to say, I'm going to keep moving forward no matter what. Um, especially when you feel like all of life is coming against you. And we often feel like that, don't we? On your head. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, and that's not new. That's a part of what it means, in fact, to be human. It's not a unique attribute for this, the early part of the 21st century. There's always been that sense that humans have that sometimes life goes well and sometimes life's really hard. And so what do you do, especially when the life is difficult? Preserve the works of your mercy. Hello. <laughs> so I want to break that down a little bit and talk about perseverance in the light of what it is the scripture has to say. Especially, first of all, the thing I want to call to your attention first is that the question is, preserve the works of your, do you remember it? Mercy. Now, because it's important for us to understand that who we are, and I mean all of us, who we are is the object of God's mercy. First and foremost, we are the object of God's mercy. What that means is, I'm always a debtor. I'm in need for God to come and help me out, even though I don't deserve it, even though I don't qualify for it, even though if God were to sort of put my life on the scales of justice and say, oh, I don't know, you know, you're not, you haven't been all that great recently. I don't know whether I should help you out or not. You see, that's, we need the mercy of God. I don't qualify left to my own devices. You see, if I think in any way that I qualify for the mercy of God, that sets up an incredibly difficult dynamic. And how it shows up is we treat people poorly. Because, you see, if I think I qualify, that means I'm probably better than you. <laughs> right? And you know where that takes me? That takes me being critical. Because you see, you're, you're not measuring up. And where does that lead? It leads to gossip. It leads to people talking about each other behind their backs. And it's deadly. My wife's reading, she loves mystery novels. So she's reading this novel by Louise Penny. And the book is called A Great Re Reckoning. <laughs> and last night, she was lying in bed reading this book and she said, she's real quiet all of a sudden, she goes, this is really good. <laughs> and she reads it aloud and I thought, oh, I want to use it. And here's the comment in the book. Rumors are hard to prove, but they are even harder to disprove. We both know that character assassination is easy. All it takes is a suggestion. A well-placed word in someone's ear like a bullet to the brain, <coughs> murdering someone's reputation. When that begins to happen, it inevitably has to do with the fact that the tale bearer has a false view of himself before God. Because you see, if I understand that I'm actually the object of God's mercy, that I really don't qualify in any way for the grace that has been given to me in Jesus Christ, and that I am a debtor, and that before the cross of Christ, everybody gets leveled. There, there are no gradations. 
I mean, it's it, it, it's not like here. Whereas we've got some people, well, who are they? Well, they're, they're really over there. But where are the holy people? Well, we're the ones sitting up here. We're closer to God, and you see, therefore, that means we're better. No, you see, not at all. Just the opposite. And in fact, the scripture even goes so far as to say, in case we just didn't get the point, to whom much is given, much is required. Which actually means if I'm here and somebody's there, I'm actually even in a greater need for God's mercy. Does that make sense? In other words, there's no such thing as sort of bad sins and really wicked sins. We think that way because that's how our system of justice operates. Let the punishment meet the crime, Gilbert and Sullivan said. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is that before God, we're all on the same foothold. Before the cross, we stand equally before each other. Which is why at the end of the Jeremiah reading, when God promises that something new is going to happen in the earth, and they will all know the Lord, how is that possible? Last line, for what? I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. That is in fact what makes this Christian community even possible. Because God chooses, not because we deserve it, but because He loves us so dearly and so profoundly to look at us and say, I love you. You're a mess. <laughs> and I don't want to leave you that way. Repent of your sins. And I will bring mercy. And I will, be, I will bring forgiveness. And you will, in fact, be right with God. And you will literally be carried on the promises of God, even to the very place of heaven when you die. And all of that is God. It's God's action. <laughs> you see, if it's left up to me, I mess up. Which is why, you see, I need His help to be able to persevere. But the beginning of godly perseverance is an understanding that I am a debtor to God. I don't deserve what I have. And that all of my life is nothing more and nothing less than a complete reliance upon His mercy. Great line, Old Testament, Jeremiah. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Oh, thank God. I mean, uh, let's, let, let me be really frank. I, I know the state of my life. If... if if I didn't have the mercy of God operating, I sure as heck would not qualify to stand in this office. All of us live with deep, profound struggles. And the fact of the matter is, is that while some people's sin struggles are more obvious than others, none of us don't have them. None of us. So if I understand that if so-and-so's struggle over here is more visible, and I use that as an opportunity to gossip and criticize that person behind his or her back, all I'm actually doing is showing to other people my own arrogance. My own sin. I'm in fact using that, even though it's not my intention, I'm actually using that opportunity to make my sins visible, even as I'm talking about her sins or his sins. Do you follow? Which is why the call to walking together in unity, which is so deeply a part of what the New Testament teaches, is so critically important because all of us, all of us, want to be divisive at some point or another. Because we want our way. Mommy. And if we want our way, we can be ruthless Mommy. in getting what it is that we want. We won't let anybody stand in our way. Can you go ahead and take her? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. We have five. 
<laughs> so that means that's why we begin by saying preserve the works of your mercy. That's where we start. And we never ever leave that place. We're always in the position of needing and asking for the mercy of God. So what does God do in response to the cry of his mercy? First thing is, is the promise of his forgiveness. I will remember their sins no more. It is the devil that reminds you of what you did yesterday for which you still feel condemned. If you said, God, please forgive me, it's washed away. It's gone. <laughs> if I didn't know that was true, I'd be in a huge trouble. <laughs> so we. So it really is. The mercies are literally new every morning, and we never get beyond that. But when that begins to have its way in our hearts, and we understand that we are in fact the objects of God's mercy, what that actually does is inspire us to know this God who loves us with such a deep and profound everlasting love. And that takes us right to the scriptures. That's why in this lectionary, there's this whole teaching on, in 2 Timothy about the place of the Word of God and what it is and how it operates. Because it's really not an exaggeration to call the Bible God's love letter to us. But we can never receive it in that way unless we really understand that it is God's action. It is in fact a part of His mercy that He gives us His Word. So that we're not left to our own devices. We're not just sort of making it up as we go along. I mean, I know plenty of people that try to live their life that way, and it never works. So, he's the writer, Paul is so clear. He lays out, what does it mean? It's inspired by God. It's useful for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And what that means is, in the midst of the challenges that you and I face, whether they be personal, whether they be relational, whether they be church, whether it's business, whether it's my social life, or even as I'm wrestling with what's going on, I go back to the Bible and say, okay, God, but what does the scripture say about this? And how do I find a way to live that out? Because the way the scripture des describes its own purpose is that if we delve into it, if we work with it, if we learn from it, we will be equipped for every good work. But I can never enter into the Bible in the way the Scripture intends if it doesn't start with that place of humility, knowing that, God, I'm hungry for your instruction. Thank you for your forgiveness. Teach me your ways. There are plenty of people who don't go to the Bible that way and they use it to justify their own opinions. And that is a profound misuse of the Scripture. If I use the Bible to condemn somebody else, that's a misuse of the Bible. Because I'm the one who is in the need of God's mercy. See, do you understand? That's another way, in a very religious context, you see, of me elevating myself over somebody else. Come on, family of God. And we're all guilty of that. We would love to have the Bible reinforce what it is that we believe. Right? Not your head. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that all of us are in fact humbled by the Scriptures. And then encouraged by the Scriptures. And then taught by the Scriptures. So that it's not a weapon. Except against the enemy. That's the devil. That's not another human being. So that's why we go to the scriptures. That's why it's the next second pillar. If I'm going to persevere, what do I need? I need the mercy of God. I need the instruction of the word of God to teach me and to help correct what I don't know that is right and wrong so that I can find a way to serve this God who loves me and who cares for me so deeply. And what does God promise to the people who walk in that sense of mercy, who are walking under the authority of what the scripture says and teaches? The last lines of the gospel, I love. Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? 
Will he delay long in helping, helping them? And the rhetorical answer is no. I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. Why? Because life's hard. Sometimes it feels like life is just like this unjust judge. And what Jesus is doing in that story is con contrasting the unjust judge on the one hand and the beautiful mercy of God on the other. In other words, what Jesus is saying, God's not at all like that unjust judge. No, just, just the opposite. But then there's this poignant line at the end, and this is where I want to wrap it up. And yet, he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Meaning Jesus knows that if we don't get what we want, if we use the Bible as a weapon, if we walk away rather than being real instruments that God uses to express His love and His care and His servanthood. That's faithlessness. And when life gets hard, those are the temptations. Right? When I don't get what I want, when life gets painful and difficult, what do I want to do? I want to blame other people. I want to get mad at God and think that God is just like that unjust judge. And what do I do? I want to give up. Or I want to do worse, which is actually become an, <laughs> do everything I can to get what I want and to get my way, even if it actually mars the reputation of other people. All of those are temptations that we feel. You're not unique if you have those kinds of things going on in your life. That's a part of, again, that's, those are the temptations that we face when life goes badly. And that's why the poignancy of the question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Meaning God is looking for a group of men and women who are willing to walk with that kind of tender heart toward his mercy. Who understand that we always are in need of his forgiveness. Who are willing, even in the face of adversity, to be generous and to be kind and to protect the person who might be the object of gossip. That's, that's what it means to walk in the steps of Christ. Because you see, that's who He is. Beloved, if it doesn't look like Jesus, it's just not Christian. Period. End of story. And so that's why we come back to the beginning and say, Oh Lord, if I'm going to walk in this way, I need Your forgiveness. I need Your mercies. And the promise is, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Today we have some people who are coming to present themselves to say yes to Christ. It's a life decision. It's a courageous decision. And there are huge promises that they're going to make and that we will make, you see, with them. Because we also have taken that step in the past. And it's always, I will, what? With God's help. <laughs> because it's big stuff to which we are committed. But the with God's help is the acknowledgement that I need His help. And I'm grateful to receive it. So that always, in my life, God, please, and in our life, we might not be a testimony to arrogance, but a testimony to mercy. Because that's who we are. We are the work of God's mercy. And for that, I am deeply grateful. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, You who are so quick to forgive, We come to You, O oh Lord. And as we are about to again affirm the commitments that we've made to You, cry out that You would clothe us as we make these commitments in Your mercies. That You would forgive us, O oh Lord, as this prayer book says, those things of which our conscience is afraid. And that we might know You as that strong and everlasting and powerful God 
who loves, serves, cares, and forgives. May St. Margaret's Church be a testimony in this community to your mercy. Because we need it, Lord, so desperately. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.